Um, you can put your, your questions in the chat bar on the right side of the video, on the right side of your screen. Um, so please um, put all of your questions and, and you thoughts get her there. To jam out a little. And, um, and then you can also, if you're having technical issues, there's a widget on the bottom left side of the screen. So you can um, chat with us there if you're having technical issues. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, um, Dr. David Paulson. Um, Dr. Paulson holds an emeritus position at Rothamsted Research and is also a visiting professor in soil science at the University of Reading in the UK and Southwest University in Chongqing, China. And he's gonna be discussing long-term soil health research at Rothamsted. So um, and now I'll, we'll, let, we'll hear from Dr. Paulson. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's David Paulson. I'm a Lost Trust Senior Fellow at Rothamsted Research, uh, based in the UK. Um, I've, I've been at Rothamsted for a good many years. Uh, in fact, at the moment, I'm based at home because of the pandemic. Um, I'd just like to thank the organisers of this conference for inviting me to participate. It's an honour and a privilege to be here. Um, Right, so you can see my um, title, a bit long-winded, Long-Term Field Experiments, Soil Carbon and Climate Change. So these are the topics I was asked to, um, to cover. So as you probably know at uh, Rothamsted Research in the UK, close to London, we have some, in fact, we have the oldest continuing long-term uh, agricultural field experiments in the world. Um, I'm going to talk about the the two on the left uh, of the screen, the winter wheat experiment, Broadbalk, started in 1843, and the Hoosfield spring barley experiment, started in 1852. Uh, but just to, um, to comment that we don't only do old stuff, this slide has got two, the left-hand panel of this slide um, shows you a picture of an experiment started t just 10 years ago by colleagues at our site in southwest of England, which is a high rainfall area with a lot of um, grassland and so this experiment is on um, grazed pasture with sheep and cattle and there are hydrologically separated um, fields really where inputs and outputs are measured with a lot of instrumentation. Um, and on the right hand side of the slide again just to emphasize that we're very keen to network with other long-term sites around the world. We've done this for various different reasons and this one just tells you about an initiative that was started uh, about three years away uh, three years ago the global long-term experiment network gl10 it's often called right long-term experiments should we think of them as untouchable museum exhibits or living laboratories well you, you probably know my answer to that um, experiments have become long-term uh, very often started um, in order to answer some agronomic questions within the environment that, that they were set. Um, and often those, those questions were answered to some extent within a few years. And if the experiment then survived and became long term, then to take on a bit of a, um, um, a life of its own. And at that stage, they tend to become living laboratories is not the term I like to use, which have a huge range of values. I've put sort of two, um, I've grouped the, some of the values together here. On the left, I said there are sort of sustainability issues can be addressed through such experiments, looking at long-term trends of crop yields and so on. Um, slow changes in soil. So for example, pH changes pretty slowly. I'm gonna talk about soil organic carbon today. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've said that these are ready-made experimental platforms where you can investigate mechanisms, test hypotheses. If you want, for example, to have a soil that's never had nitrogen fertilizer compared with one that has, there you have them in such experiments. Or you want a low phosphate and a high phosphate soil, but everything else the same, here you have them. Now, these are the gentlemen that started our experiments uh, in 1843, John Bennett Laws. Um, and Joseph Henry Gilbert. Laws hired Gilbert um, because he recognised he needed someone who, who knew more about chemistry than he did, and they worked together for over 50 years. 
but I always like to show this picture of Laws as a young man because I, I like to want to encourage younger scientists. You don't have to wait till you're as old as Laws is in the traditional picture, or, or as indeed as old as I am with with beards like this, um, in order to do something useful. Laws was do, started experimentation uh, during when he was in his twenties, um, so be encouraged. You can start now. Uh, more recently, people have been important in, in our long-term experiments. I've pictured here Johnny Johnston, some of you may know. Um, he was very instrumental in um, rejigging some of our experiments in the 1960s and 70s to, to make them more valuable in some more modern era. And then Paul Poulton and after him Andy McDonald became the managers of our long-term experiments. He's a good colleagues and friends. And then also Margaret Glendinning, who now curates the, the data um, from our experiments in, a, a, um, I think, what we call the ERA, Electronic Rothamsted Archive. And I have to mention, my again, my, my mentor and for many years friend, David Jenkinson, um, who became very well known for studies on soil carbon and nitrogen, and he was a great user of the long-term experiments. And here he is standing in the archive, holding a, a bottle of the precious archived soil. Um, Here's a pic two pictures of the Broadbought wheat experiment. Um, it started in 1843, but it looked like the black and white picture pretty much until the, the 1920s. Um, there were plots that were nearly 400 meters long, I think about six meters wide, going the whole length of the field, comparing different mixtures of different fertilizers and organic manures. And it stayed like that till the 1920s, but about that time, it was the plots were divided into five sections in order to introduce fallowing because weeds had become a problem then. So there was a rotation including fallows. Um, then there was this big re, um, regeneration, if you like, of the experiment in 1968, um, where the plots were now divided into 10 sections. Some of them remained as wheat every year, as had been the case from the start. Um, but the, uh, the two other main innovations then were bringing in crop rotations in many of the sections, and those have changed a bit at different times, and introducing the new shorter straw wheat varieties, right, the Green Revolution uh, varieties. Um, then in 2001, some other uh, changes were introduced. And we have drains under each plot. They've been there from the beginning, but they became old and blocked up in the 1990s. We renewed them for one section of the experiment. So we've got we've kept the, kept the main core treatments, but we've made innovations to make the, the experiment we think more useful to us now. And I've um, written here what I call my three fundamentals for long term experiments. One is multidisciplinary decision making. Don't let them be run just by the soil scientists or the plant pathologists or the agronomists. We need all of the expertise from many different people. So we have a sort of a, a working committee that's multidisciplinary. Um, this is important all the time, but especially when you're thinking about making changes. Um, second, what very detailed and accurate record keeping. You can see on the uh, on the right hand side there a, um, a page from one of the original notebooks, very um, meticulously done. Uh, but nowadays um, things are as quickly as possible put into an electronic form into this electronic Rothamsted archive. And summaries of the data are made readily available through that as well. And then thirdly, archive samples. Um, we've got um, an archive that contains about a third of a million samples of soils, crops and manures now. And these are incredibly valuable because you can do things with them that you would never have thought of doing um, at the start. So I'm now going to say a little bit about the, the crop yields, first on the winter wheat experiment. Um, and then on the Hoosfield spring barley experiment. So with the winter wheat, um, it's um, sown in what we call the, the autumn, you call the fall, uh, probably in about um, October, and then harvest it goes through winter as a small plants, then he's harvested the following um, August, probably about then. Whereas the spring barley is um, sown in the spring. Uh, so here's some yields from a few experiment, a few, treatments from the wheat, the winter wheat experiment. Um, you can see the, um, the light blue line at the bottom is the yields with the nil treatment, no inputs at all. 
um, very low yield. In fact, this, this crop really is surviving on nitrogen inputs from the atmosphere in rain and, and gaseous dry deposition. Um, then you can see um, that the treatments which had either inorganic fertilizers, NPK, or farmyard manure, have been going along giving about the same yield as each other for many, many years. It's quite surprising. I'll comment on that in a moment. You can see from 1968, when the new short straw, high grain yielding varieties were introduced, got a big jump in yields. And here we've now got the wheat growing continuously every year and wheat in rotation. We go a much higher yield if the first wheat after a break crop. But again, we still see the inorganic fertilizer and the manure uh, treatments giving almost the same yield. Come back to that point. Oh, um, and this blue line that's just appeared here shows you the Na UK national average wheat yield. So you can see we're, we're bracketing them with our lower and higher um, yields. Now, as I say, it seems quite surprising that we get the same yields with both treatments because the farmyard manure uh, treatments have been, the soil carbon, which is shown here, have been going up enormously where manure is applied. It's between two and three times greater than on the unmanured or the inorganic fertilizer treatment. You can also notice that the treatment given inorganic fertilizers, organic carbon in the soil, is a little bit higher than on the unmanured. So you've got much bigger crops, putting in a bit more root and stubble organic matter material compared to unmanured. Now here is the, uh, again, some selected treatments on the spring barley experiment. And here we've got a different story. I'll put in this uh, thing here. Um, here we cannot get the, the biggest possible yield if we do not have higher organic matter content in the soil uh, resulting from manures. Um, so comparing the manure treatment plus some extra N with the best we can do with inorganic fertilizers, we've got a, a yield gap of about um, two and a half tons per hectare. So a completely different story from the, um, from the winter wheat experiment. Now, what's that? So we've got these contrasting situation. The winter wheat seems to be insensitive to organic matter content of the soil, but the spring barley is sensitive. It only reaches the highest yield where the organic matter content of the soil is higher from these manure applications. And I think the reason, my hypothesis is that the reason for this difference um, is that winter wheat is a very long duration crop. It's in the ground for about 10 months of the year and it's got plenty of time to overcome poor early growth. And early growth is poorer on the low organic matter soil. Whereas spring barley is a short duration crop. It's only in the ground for between five to six months. So it's got no time to make up. It can't make up lost time like the winter wheat. And I think perhaps in the past, some of my predecessors have perhaps put more emphasis on the wheat result and perhaps tended, not intentionally, to play down the organic matter, the importance of organic matter, whereas actually globally, the shorter duration crops are, um, are more prominent around the world. You know, in, in um, northern climes, we've got a very cold winter. You can't grow winter wheat like we do, so crops will always be grown in, sown in spring. And in tropical situations, um, two crops a year will be very common, like wheat maize or, um, or, or, or rice wheat situations. Um, this perhaps surprising result on the yields is in line with a much bigger meta-analysis done by colleagues at uh, Wageningen University. It was the PhD work of uh, Remska Hijbik um, and her colleagues at Wageningen and my colleague at Rothamsted, Andy Whitmore. And they, their question was, in the box here, is, is there a unique effect on crop yield of adding manure in addition to the obvious the fact that the manure is supplying nutrients? So they had quite a lot of sites around Europe, but they only chose ones where both the manure treatment, shown in green here, and the no manure treatment, both of them had a range of nitrogen fertilizer applications. And they then compared the best yield you could get in both situations, thus trying to eliminate the nutrient, purely nutrient effects. And this is a sort of summary from their paper, their results, a nice piece of work. And they said that actually the overall effect of the organic 
extra organic matter was surprisingly small. But if you look at the, the, the middle panel here on the left, um, what they points to the right of the dotted line mean that there is a, an additional yield effect of the organic input. And you can see with sugar beet, potatoes and maize, corn for you, um, yes, there is an effect over and above uh, nutrients. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, but these are all spring sown crops. If you look in the cereals at the bottom, um, there is a, an effect with the spring sown cereals, but not with the, the winter sown ones. So that's exactly in line with what we sell at Rothamsted. Right, now turning to more directly to organic matter in soil, contains about 50% carbon. I would say that we can look at it through two lenses, if you like. There's the soil quality or soil health lens, looking at the, the properties of the soil. And this has obviously got implications for food security and all aspects of sustainability. Or we can look at it through the global carbon cycle lens. Um, uh, and this affects climate change, which may make climate change either worse if more carbon is released from soils to the atmosphere, or better, if more can be locked up, so-called sequestration. And the reason that this matters is that the quantity of organic carbon in the world's soils is very large, estimated to a depth of one meter to be about 1,500 gigatons, which is approximately twice the amount of carbon in the CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's a big pool, so it does potentially matter. Just to complicate things, of course, as you'll know, agriculture is a, a source of methane, uh, CH4, from wet soils, and uh, nitrous oxide. So it's not fully, climate change is not just a carbon uh, story. Right, so for the soil health, soil quality aspect of things, it's the concentration of organic matter, organic carbon in soil that's key. And there's evidence that even a small change can have a large effect on soil properties, especially physical properties. And I'll come back to that later on in this talk. But for climate change mitigation, it's the absolute quantities of carbon that, that, that is key. How many gigatons can we lock up? Right. Now the quantity of organic carbon in soil is in some ways quite simple. It's a balance between inputs and outputs. So there's inputs, of course, in roots always, um, and crop residues if they're returned and in manures and compost and the like if they're used they go into the soil the soil fauna and microbes um, work use those inputs as substrates a large amount of the carbon coming in is then evolved as co2 or, or methane if it's a flooded situation like in rice and then there are other much small, smaller losses um, the rate of which this happens depends on soil type and climate and also if you like the ratio of how much carbon goes off the of CO2 to how much is held in the soil as orga soil organic matter or humus if you like again depends on soil type and climate. So this is um, many of you will recognize this is Professor Ratan Lal of um, uh, who's a very well-known soil scientist. Um, and this is a picture of him standing in our Broadbalk field he visited a few years back. And um, you can see in his hands here, he's got a, a clod of soil from the farmyard manure plot, darker color than from the plot with no inputs. And you can't see here, but it's much better structured. Here is a, I suppose you might say, a more scientific way of looking at soil structure. Uh, nice piece of work. Um, done on the Bad Laustadt long-term experiment uh, in Germany that started in 1902. And in this work, the, um, um, the scientists use X-ray um, CT computer tomography scanning in order to visualize soil pores, the spaces between aggregates or the um, uh, larger pores, biopores made by earthworms and the like. And in um, this experiment, there are uh, a no manure treatment at the bottom, a middle rate of manure and a higher rate of manure. And I think you can see straight away that the black, that not black, the dark red squiggles uh, are where the pores are and you've got more pores where you've got manure added. And all of the manure treatments have got um, an, an added uh, a part which has inorganic fertilizers added. And again, I think you can see that where that's done and you get actually a bigger crop yield, there's more uh, root stubble input to the soil and again more pores. Um, 
So the coarse pores are beneficial for both root growth, growth and uh, water movement. Right, now let's turn to the carbon, uh, global carbon cycle and climate change aspect of uh, soil carbon. So we're into carbon sequestration now as the word that's used. And you'll hear these words I've written on the right here, carbon farming, natural climate solutions, regenerative agriculture. Many of you might well be um, uh, familiar with the um, uh, really quite remarkable claims, I think, outlandish claims in my view, made for, by the Rodale Institute recently about what regenerative agriculture can do for climate change. And you may well be aware of the four per thousand initiative that I'll talk about in a moment. But here's just a diagram of the global carbon cycle. Um, a colleague uh, gave this rather nice picture to me. And you can see here's the atmospheric CO2 with about 750 gigatons of carbon half the amount that's in the soils and we've got photosynthesis going on here carbon going from atmosphere to plants and then into soil and we've got respiration from soil and photorespiration from plants plus representative of deforestation and fossil fuel burning carbon sequestration means transferring some of the carbon that's in the atmospheric co2 to land which might be going in the direction of the arrow, or it might mean slowing uh, respiration, say, for example, going in the other direction. Now, if, um, if, we, if, we, if we want to try and um, achieve soil carbon sequestration to mitigate or slow climate change, there's some point, very fundamental points we must consider. There has to be a net transfer of carbon from atmosphere to land and then into soil, not just a redistribution of carbon. We'll come on to that in a, few, in a moment. But for example, with zero tillage, although there is a, I think, a slowing down of soil carbon decomposition, the biggest effect of zero tillage is to alter the distribution of soil carbon with depth. I'll show you that in a moment. And with manures, the biggest, they have a big effect on soil carbon, but they're really moving carbon from one place in the landscape to another. We should also, when considering sequestration, remember that soil carbon moves towards sort of a, an equilibrium, a new, a new equilibrium, a sort of a maximum value. Um, and it doesn't go on going up forever. And also the rate of increase where this is happening is fastest in the early years. So you, well, again, I'll show you an example in a moment, but you need to be careful when you see claims of rates of carbon sequestration, because often these are quoted for the early years of a study. Later on, that rate will get slower. Um, always remember that soil carbon sequestration is reversible. If you go to zero tillage, but then back again, you could lose benefits. And there's some other, some other points as well. On the right hand side, I said, look, well, if we've got some pr management practices that are good for sequestering carbon, can they be widely practiced? Now, some already are widely practiced, so it's not really appropriate, it's not valid to say, let's, you know, let's do this if we're doing it already. So, for example, in my country, in the UK, about 50% of cereal straw crop residue is already directly returned to soil. And in fact, the remainder is used as animal bedding. So much of that will come back to soil as, as manure. Um, and in many parts of the world, particularly South America, reduced tillage is very commonly used. So introducing that would not be a new uh, treatment. Um, food security, this means what I have in mind here is that a very good way of increasing soil carbon is to take land out of agricultural production, to reforest, if you like, or something of that sort. That's fine, but you're not producing food anymore. Um, and there are various practical barriers to some of the practices, and you've got to be thought about for each one. OK, let me say something about this four per mill initiative. This was um, launched in, in Paris by the French Minister of Agriculture at the uh, 2015 uh, climate conference that was a very beneficial conference. What they said here was that if we increase by four parts per thousand, that's 0.4%, every year the quantity of carbon contained in the world's soils, we can halt the annual 
um, increase uh, in CO2, that we can halt the annual increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Now that's a huge claim um, and surprised many people. In order to really do that, you would have to be locking up between seven and nine gigatons of carbon would be sequestering that annually because that's about the amount of, of CO2 emission, carbon and CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. So th there's been a huge criticism and debate over this initiative saying that they're claiming far too much. And in fact, if you read papers about the initiative now, they've scaled back the, um, the, the claimed or suggested amount of carbon to be sequestered to more like 1.2 gigatons per year, although they think they've done that rather obliquely. And also they say that this rate of annual soil carbon increase is aspirational, saying, oh no, don't worry too much about the numbers, might not achieve it, but it's good to aim at it. Well, that's sort of true, but I do feel it's a bit tricky wording. But on the positive side, any increase in soil carbon is good for soil health and soil functioning. Um, again, there was a, a well-known paper with huge numbers of authors um, published in Geoderma, um, what, four years ago now, um, Minasni et al. Um, and this paper provoked, again, a huge amount of controversy over the four per mil initiative. Uh, I've got a quote at the bottom there from um, Wim de Vries at Barkeningen. He said, it's a good initiative, but let's manage not only the soil, but also the expectations. And um, another, again, well-known paper by uh, Bill Schlesinger and Ronald Amundsen um, has a nice title, Managing Soil Carbon Sequestration, Let's Get Realistic. And I, I like that title uh, very much. They say that the amount of carbon you can really lock up in soils is likely to be pretty limited and a distraction to policymakers. I'll come back to that point. Um, just uh, again, about three or so years ago at Rothamsted, my colleagues and I looked at the rate of carbon increase in our long term experiments in treatments where we expected this to be happening. And we said in our paper that there are major limitations to achieving this rate of four parts per thousand per year, uh, at least in agricultural soils in temperate regions. Didn't say it was impossible, but major limitations. And we looked at a number of experiments over three soil types, mostly at one site, but a couple of others as well, and the treatments that you can see listed there on the left of that slide. And I'm just gonna show you a very few examples uh, from that work now. So this is actually a summary of what we found. Um, so the, 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 the um, bars here represent the range of increases in topsoil carbon expressed as parts per thousand per year for a range of different treatments. And I should say that because we, the, the, part, the four per mil initiative now is to reverse, refer to a soil depth of 40 centimetres. We were actually only looking at 23 centimetres in our treatments. That's nine inches in old money, uh, in order to get four per mil in that, in the deeper layer, you need seven per mil in the shallower layer. So the, that's why our dotted red line here is at seven per mil. So picking out some of the biggest ones, manure was very good for increasing soil carbon. The middle one here, if we add a high rate of manure, very high rate, to a soil that started low in carbon, we get very big rates of increase. Um, if we added it to a soil that was already high in carbon, not so much, uh, as you would expect. Uh, yep, with land use change, if we took land out of arable um, agriculture, went to grass or to woodland, again, we could easily achieve this four per mil rate. But of course, taking land out of agriculture. So here's an example from manure. This is on the Hoosfield, the spring barley experiment. It's been going since 1852. We've got organic carbon in the soil plotted here against time. Here, here's the curve, it's going up, as you can see, moving towards a sort of a new equilibrium level. Very high rates of increase early on, um, 18 parts per thousand per year in the first 20 years, um, down to about one. So it's almost leveled off um, by now. Now, that's, this is sort of, in a sense, academically interesting um, and it's useful for data for modeling and so on. But in practice, we cannot do this. Um, actually, 
the EU in the EU, I'm afraid my country just left it, but in the EU and the UK, you would not be allowed to add this much manure because it leads to massive nitrate leaching. In fact, we've um, measured it on this site and few farmers would have that much manure. But also very importantly, um, manure, any manure to soil is good for increasing carbon, but it's not an additional transfer of carbon from the atmosphere. If you've got animals, you've got the manure anyway. You might put it on one field or the other, and there are ways of using it more effectively and sensibly, but it's not extra carbon from the atmosphere. It's carbon that's been locked into something already. And here's the land use change treatment on the Broadwall site. So this is where the, the field was in arable up till 1881 and uh, then it was reverted through natural regeneration to woodland as you can see on the picture here and again early on we've got very high rates of soil carbon increase and it's still still going up somewhat so this is good way of increasing soil carbon and achieving four per mil but the land is removed from agriculture you're not growing food anymore so um, there is a limit to how much you, you can do that, well, li very limited potential. There is some, there's good reasons for having small areas of farm woodlands, perhaps on low productivity soils within a farm. They're good for wildlife habitats. Also perhaps on former industrial sites where the soil is polluted, you don't want to grow food. Um, but the areas are not very large. I do think, and I'm not going to say any more about it, agroforestry is something which really we ought to be looking at more, getting trees into agricultural land. Um, but of course, at the moment, the opposite is happening, sadly. Um, deforestation is happening, um, as you can see in the pictures here, um, in um, the Amazon area, but also in Southeast Asia and in areas of Africa, and draining of peat soils, which again is le leading to huge release of carbon or CO2. Um, right, another treatment that was looked at in our um, uh, study was changing from continuous arable cropping, arable crops every year, to what's what a, we call a lay arable system, where you grow pasture for a number of years, then go into the arable cropping. And uh, here's a site, it's on a sandy soil that my colleagues, what Johnny Johnson and others, uh, looked at in detail a few years ago. And they've got basically three main treatments here, the continuous arable and the rate of change of soil carbon there over 35 years was very small, it was slightly negative, but really not significantly different from zero. If they had a three year pasture and two year arable rotation, there was again very little change here. If they went to an eight year pasture and two year arable, they got a substantial uh, increase in soil carbon, seven or nine uh, parts per thousand. So that's good. Um, but of course, you're only growing arable crops in two years out of the 10. Um, so that's a, you know, there are food security issues there. And I want to give you another example of a, of a land use change. I'm going to another long-term experiment now. This is the Askol experiment in Denmark, started in 1894. I was very happy to be there a few years back when they had their 125th um, anniversary celebration, time when we could have gatherings of people and, and could travel. They have two sites at Askol. One of them, the plots are pretty small, and they decided that the soil, soil movement had become too bad. So ploughing every year meant the, soil, the plots were getting smeared out. So they decided that in 1998 to stop further soil movement by stopping growing arable crops and convert to grass as a way of sort of preserving the experiment. And in a recent paper, the colleagues there measured the change of soil carbon after this change to grass. So you can see in their case, in the arable period, in long period, soil carbon was going down slightly, perhaps just about leveling off. Um, but then when they changed to grass, it increased in all cases um, at an average rate over that number of years of 18 parts per thousand, you know, over 14 years. So yep, there's an example of taking land out of arable agriculture is good for soil carbon. Now, reduced tillage, we didn't actually have any experiments on our uh, sites at Rothamsted, so we've, we've looked elsewhere. Now, with reduced tillage, if reduced tillage truly slows down 
the decomposition of organic matter in soil, then this is genuine climate change mitigation. It means less CO2 going from land to atmosphere. So that's true. And I think in the long term, that, that is the case with zero tillage. However, the biggest effect, the most very obvious one, is a concentration of organic carbon near the soil surface. So I'll show you in a moment. Now, this is very good for seedling emergence. It's very good for water infiltration and actually may be relevant for flood control in places where, <clears throat> where um, we're getting increased rainfall, certainly in my country. Excuse me. So um, zero tillage, I think over time, um, is really is genuine carbon sequestration, but not as much as is often claimed because of this depth redistribution. It's got other benefits. It's certainly good for earthworms and their benefits and for water retention. So here is some nice, again, a meta-analysis done by uh, Angier and Erickson Hamill, Hamill, Erickson Hamill in Canada quite some years ago now. And what they've plotted here is, and we've reproduced it in something I did, um, the ratio of the additional organic sea in no-till soil to organic sea in the conventionally tilled soil uh, for different depths. So any points to the right of the red dotted line mean, yeah, yes, you are accumulating extra carbon. And you can see in this surface soil, big increases in carbon, but sort of near the base of the plow layer, uh, less carbon. So in the short term, the net effect is, is, not, is not much in terms of total amount of carbon. We're saying the longer term, it looks like you definitely do start accumulating carbon in most cases, but not necessarily everywhere. Um, again, a few years ago, I was working uh, with some colleagues from CIMIT, the International Wheat and Maize Improvement Centre, looking at uh, soil carbon in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Asia. And um, with those colleagues and with some um, American colleagues as well, who you'll recognise, um, we wrote a sort of a, a discussion paper about this. What we said was this, we said no-till agriculture can deliver significant benefits for farmers um, and sustainability in many, but not all situations. The reduced gre re greenhouse gas emissions are, are a small but important additional benefit, not the key policy driver for its adoption. Well, I just want to say something else just about terminology. I call it confused terminology. If we're interested in soils that are continuing in agriculture to grow food and, and, and other materials for us, then we're interested in what's in this green box. What, how much carbon, extra carbon, can we get into these agricultural soils? Now, as I've already said, we can certainly sequester carbon by removing land from agriculture, but of course that's got huge impacts on food production globally. And you've just got the sort of opposite situation. We can avoid carbon losses by making sure that we're not deforesting, we're not depleting places that have already got a big stock of carbon, like the peat soils in um, tropical areas, Southeast Asia, or indeed in the, in the northern um, uh, latitudes. Now, I think that's, this is relevant because often I think those different way, things that affect carbon, different practices that affect carbon are, are lumped together. And this can be a bit misleading, I think. Now I'm gonna refer here to a paper by Bossio et al. that came out well, this uh, last year. Um, I think it's a very good paper, very uh, thorough encyclopedic paper. Try, they try to estimate the, um, how much uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced um, in one way or another through changes in land management and land use. Um, and they look at both carbon, nitrous oxide and methane. Now I've got no way of knowing whether the estimations they come up with are good or not. It's, it's a very complex uh, paper. But I just draw your attention to this diagram from it where they, this just looks at the carb soil carbon. So what they've got here they're plotting the soil organic carbon mitigation potential for a range of treatments that they looked at. It expresses gigatons of CO2 equivalent um, per year uh, for these what they call 12 natural pathways for climate mitigation. Now, first of all, you can see that one of the um, treatments that gives quite a big effect, the light gray here, which they say is cost effective and there's um, economics are included in this paper that I'm not competent to talk about. 
uh, reforestation of land has a big effect. As I've already said, there's a I think there's a limit to how much of that we can do because of needing land for food production. Um, and then you've got the um, uh, treatments that I've marked in red here that are all avoided carbon losses. So avoided forest conversion, avoided grassland conversion, avoided peat impacts and other wetlands and coastal things. So those avoided carbon losses, um, if I add up correctly, come to about 70% of the total storage potential that they talk about. So that's not actually extra carbon sequestered in agricultural soils. It could be misunderstood as that, but it's not. It's holding on to carbon that's already there. And through policies of stopping deforestation, peat drainage, et cetera, et cetera, avoiding emitting that carbon. Um, in this paper also put a, quite a lot of emphasis on biochar. Um, you know, some very big um, numbers here. Now, I think, um, this is very questionable how applicable that is for a whole range of reasons but we might want to talk about that later. Now in the last section of my talk I um, want to give you some good news. Good news on organic carbon. The good news is that a little goes a long way. A small increase in soil carbon can have a large impact on soil properties both physical and biological. I'm going to give you three examples then draw to a conclusion. Um, a few years back um, with some colleagues at Rotham said, uh, we did a, um, um, a review of experiments where straw had been either incorporated or not. In fact, it was part of an ASA uh, session on straw incorporation, because at that time uh, there was interest in removing straw to be burned for um, en producing energy. So we reviewed data from 25 experiments in the places that you can uh, read there. And what we found was that, yes, as you'd expect, where straw was retained, there was a trend to soil carbon to increase, but it was a very small trend. It was only statistically significant in six out of the 25 experiments. And I think this is because a large part of the carbon input from crops goes in via the roots and the stubble, not through the straw. But so there's a very small, there's a trend, but it's very small. However, in some of those 25 experiments, the scientists measured either microbial biomass, the carbon held in the cells of living organisms, or other what they called active fractions, maybe um, got at through physical separation or various uh, practices, various approaches. And they found that where they did measure these active fractions, if you like, these increased or change in response to straw um, return proportionately much more than did total soil organic carbon. And similarly, again, in some of the experiments, the scientists measured soil physical properties such as aggregate stability or penetrometer resistance. And again, there were quite big impacts on those from incorporating straw, sometimes even when there was actually no measurable change in total soil carbon. So this is showing, I think, that a small change in total carbon, organic carbon in soil, can have a big effect on important soil properties. Here's another example of physical properties, work led by my colleague um, Chris Watts there. Um, he and some of his colleagues who look at sort of soil mechanics um, have this um, machinery, a plough, they pull through the soil and you can measure the energy required to pull that plough through the soil. And they did that um, on our Broadbalk experiment. And here's a map of what they call specific draft. And so dark brown means it was more difficult to pull the plough through the soil. Lighter brown means it was easier to put it through the soil. Um, and there were some, if there were, as well as organic matter, there were effects of clay content as well. And unfortunately, clay content does vary across our site. But some people did some um, covariance analysis, try to separate them out. So I've just summarized uh, some results here. So on the nil plot, We've got a low organic carbon content and a specific draft of in the units 88 kilopascals. Where on the plot given manure, organic carbon had gone up by a very large amount and the specific draft had come down somewhat. But on the NPK plot, organic carbon had not gone up very much, just a little bit compared with the nil, but the specific draft had come down almost as much as on the manure plot where organic carbon had gone up 
enormously. And final example is actually back to this lay arable experiment, but some work done on it um, by Dan Murphy, Liz Stockdale and others, uh, some you know, Keith Golding, Paul Potton, Toby Willison some years back. They compared some properties of the continuous arable and the uh, um, soil that was in a rotation with pasture. And in the treatments they chose for this work, um, total soil organic matter increased by 11% in the treatment with the um, pasture. But microbial biomass, one of these active fractions, increased by 86%. And they also measured this um, thing called gross end mineralization, which can be thought of as a, um, an indicator of biological activity. That also went up much more than total carbon. So some concluding comments, two, two slides on this. Firstly, on long-term experiments, then on soil carbon sequestration. So on long-term experiments, I don't think I can do better than um, uh, look at the, um, the, the wise words of um, Henry Jansen at um, uh, Lethbridge, Alberta. Many of you will know him, someone I've got great respect for. He said somewhere else that long-term experiments are listening places, which is a very nice phrase. Places set aside for patient and oft-repeated measurements um, where our observations are melded into those of our predecessors then handed on as heirlooms to those who follow us. In that way, we bequeath a lengthening legacy, a library expanding with time for which to read the soil's memory and elicit portents of what is yet to be. So that's some very wise words, I think, about the value of long-term experiments. Here's some rather more boring words from me. I think they're very valuable uh, for detecting slow changes as research platforms and living laboratories. Now, finally, thinking about carbon sequestration for climate change mitigation, I would say there are some opportunities within agricultural soils, but as we said in our global change biology paper, major limitations. But I think it's important to, um, uh, to say the next line, and this is a word from the Bossio et al paper, which I agree with, is that soil carbon sequestration should be neither dismissed nor exaggerated. And there are people who perhaps do both. But if, that, if it's exaggerated, I think this removes pressure on decision makers, on our politicians, to cut greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels. It's so easy to say the soil will lock up the carbon and, and, and solve the problem. And that's simply not true. And we also need to be careful to distinguish between the opportunities for the smallish but not insignificant opportunities within agriculture from the different uh, kettles of fish, if you like, of either removing land from agriculture, but there's limitations, or retaining the carbon in existing large stocks that we have. So I put enormous emphasis on avoiding further carbon losses, stop deforestation, stop draining peats and wetlands, and perhaps paying to keep them. They're of value as they are. Um, in agricultural soils, it's always a good idea to increase or maintain soil carbon for the functioning, the quality, the health, if you like, of the soil, um, which is going to be good for soil, uh, food security and environmental sustainability. It may not doesn't guarantee you higher yield in the short run, but I think it will give you a more uh, resilient situation. And any climate change mitigation, I think should be seen as a co-benefit. Um, I've said there are many barriers um, to some of the practices that can be good for carbon, but some of them might be possible to be overcome them through policy changes. For example, if we thought that more lay arable systems was a good idea, then through subsidy payments and so on. This could be leveraged um, at national government level. Um, I've not talked about this, but I think it's very important to remember that managing nitrogen is important because um, nitrogen fertilizer has a high greenhouse gas cost, both from its manufacture and from nitrous oxide emissions when it's used. And I think we've got plenty of tools now for um, managing nitrogen more efficiently and therefore reducing losses through crop sensing, precision agriculture, decision support systems. And I think these are probably actually equally important compared to the direct carbon sequestration. I've often said for sometimes for carbon, think nitrogen. 
Um, I've got a acknowledgements to some of my colleagues here whose work is very important in this and various funding bodies, Rotham Said Research, the UK Research Councils and the Laws Agricultural Trust. At that point I will finish with a, uh, um, a funny picture of sampling, soil sampling on Broadwalk in 1943, not, not by me I hasten to add, so thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Pallison. A really nice summary of uh, a lot of research that's been done at Rothamsted and other long-term sites. And um, I really appreciate your thoughts on the soil carbon sequestration as well. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Amelie Godin. And Dr. Godin is an associate professor at University of California, Davis. And she's going to be talking to us about the Century Experiment and other long-term research at UC Davis. So um, now we'll hear from Dr. Godin. Hello everyone, thanks for joining today. I would like to share with you some insight into best management for soil health and the potential benefit obtained at the Century Experiment, which is located on the UC Davis campus in Northern California. I want to acknowledge my uh, co-author, Meng Li and Jennifer Schmidt, uh, two former postdoc and PhD students in my lab, and Nicole Todges and Kate Scow, who have worked at and helped manage um, the Century experiment. So there's no doubt that soils can be very quickly degraded by acute or more chronic disturbances, such as tractor passes when it's too wet, erosion losses due to rain drop and, and wind, but also salinity buildup, for instance. On the other hand, um, creating soils and building their capacity to function and help regenerate ecosystem can take time, uh, especially in semi-arid irrigated system, uh, which have different soil carbon accumulation rates due to high temperature and irrigation um, and, and some real water constraint to enhance biomass inputs to soils. So in that context, um, long-term experimental platforms have been critical uh, they've been critical to support this shift in paradigm that is necessary to promote soil health and management approaches, which emphasize actually long-term gains for farmers rather than short-term fixes. They've been uh, really critical in providing insight into the long-term impact of management decision on provision of multiple ecosystem services. And because changes in soil and the environment happen gradually, networks of flagship long-term experiments have been really important to understand the real impacts of agricultural management. They've also been critical to help elucidate some of the linkages between soil health and productivity, resilience, but also resource use efficiency, economics, um, and the environment in the longer term. Those platforms um, also provide hubs for education, research, and outreach. And they are important platforms to engage student researchers, but also policymakers, farmers, and their advisors, and catalyze knowledge transfer uh, for adoption of more sustainable practices. So I'd like to spend some time today um, sharing some results we've obtained at the Century Experiment at Russell Ranch. Uh, this experiment starting 27 years ago uh, and is located in a Mediterranean climate. And unlike most other long-term agricultural cropping system study, this experiment is located in a region um, that has very, uh, that has rainfall between November and April and very little rain to no rain during the summer. Um, and basically subjected to an extended drought period accompanied by high temperature. And so the Mediterranean climate actually stretches across the Western US all the way north through central Washington state and Montana, uh, through the Southern California and New Mexico. And so you see we're located in this blue part of the Mediterranean climate, uh, which is characterized by warm, uh, by your hot, sorry, hot summer, uh, while the Mediterranean climate in, highlighted in orange has a warm and cool summer. So it can give us a very interesting glimpse into what future might look like in other region of, of the US. So we're operating in an irrigated landscape, um, which, pro which provides some unique set of opportunities and constraints when it comes down to building soil health. In terms of opportunities, 
we're in a highly productive, high value crop system. So definitely investment in, in soil health building practices um, can be perceived differently by farmers because the profit margin of those crops are usually higher than for um, staple uh, food crops such as corn or soybean. Um, we're also in a diverse landscape uh, with more than 400 crops, uh, opening some very interesting opportunities when it comes down to diversifying rotations. But also a unique set of, challenging, of, of challenges when it comes down to uh, drought, salinity, which are recurrent issues here in California, and systems that are extremely vulnerable to climate change. Uh, our soils have uh, lower levels of soil organic matter, as you would find in temperate climate. Uh, they're highly disturbed. No till is um, or, or lower disturbance systems are uh, have not been adopted um, in in our landscape. There's usually few residues, and a very interesting uh, interactions between water uh, availability and applications and soil health outcome. So what are the cover crop, uh, what are the coping systems um, that are being uh, studied at Presser Ranch uh, and the Century Experiment? Well, this experiment was started 27 years ago and originally designed to follow along a gradient of increasing irrigation, nitrogen and carbon inputs and different management philosophy. Uh, it is composed of a perennial native grass system, which is um, the, the system that was there before we, uh, the, the experiment was started and represent what we uh, call uh, the field of dream. Uh, then a rain fed and irrigated wheat systems, about six systems with plus or minus cover crops, plus or minus fertilization, and some irrigated corn tomato systems, um, which I will center my, my um, talk around because it's where we have most of the results. There's a conventional system um, of a corn tomato rotation fertilized using mineral fertilizers. There's a, a, a conventional system that we call a mixed system because it has a corn tomato rotation, but it does have a winter cover crop in the middle um, and some, that offsets some of the mineral fertilizer needs on the main crops. And then an organic system, which is certified organic, which has a cover crop, but also annual inputs of poultry manure, both on the corn um, and the tomato. All of those three systems are uh, irrigated using subsurface drip irrigation. So what are the most interesting results related to soil health that have come from this long-term experiment? Well, let's first look at soil carbon since it's uh, such an important building block for soil health. What we're uh, seeing here uh, is um, change in carbon stock over the last 20 years uh, in the conventional system, in the system with winter cover, conventional system with winter cover crop, and in the organic system here in deeper burgundy red. And you're um, seeing on this graph various soil layers, 0 to 15, 15 to 30, all the way down to 200 centimeters and the whole soil profile. First observation is that soil organic carbon concentration is usually higher uh, across all soil layers in the organic system. If we look at the whole soil profile, the organic management using compost and cover crop led to a 3.5 times greater um, organic uh, uh, carbon uh, in the soil, uh, plus 22 megagram of carbon per hectare, which is higher, ex uh, exceeding the benchmark of four per, mil, four per mil, which was set up by the United Nations a few years ago. Um, when we look at the impact of cover crops, if we look at the zero to 30 centimeter layer, um, adoption of a winter cover crop leads to increase in soil, in soil organic carbon in the top layers to um, uh, of about 1.44 megagram of carbon per hectare. Uh, and that's despite uh, frequent disturbances from tillage. If we look at active carbon and organic matter in the zero to 30 centimeter soil layer, we do see that the organic system is also um, having um, higher levels than the conventional system and the conventional system with a cover crop having uh, results somewhere in between. Now, if we look um, at uh, the overall soil profile, we see that uh, cover crops when um, 
at depths lower than 30 centimeters lead to a loss of soil carbon and that soil, some priming of soil organic carbon might occur at depths, leading to a uh, overall decrease in soil organic carbon stork um, uh, over the whole profile um, up to 13.4 megagram of carbon per hectare. So in conclusion, compost and cover crop, but especially compost promotes soil organic carbon accumulation. Cover crops are not enough in our uh, climate and system to build up soil carbon. Now let's look at other biological, physical, and chemical properties. They are here represented for the three system uh, in a heat map of normalized results. So a minimum maximum scaling that helps to visualize results measured on different scale in, in a single map and, and compare outcomes. Um, so red is a, um, a higher outcome than blue. And we see that the organic system in general is having uh, greater, soil, uh, greater values for various soil health indicators um, across uh, the biological, physical, and chemical uh, properties. If we look at some aspects in a little bit more details, we see that um, infiltration rates uh, of water are higher in the organic system compared to the conventional and mixed systems. We do not see much difference in aggregate stability, but please note the, the variation in, in some of those measurements. In terms of soil chemical property, something noticeable is the high values in uh, soil P and soil K, which is beneficial for some horticultural uh, crop uh, obtained in the organic system. And this is mostly due to the fact that uh, to meet the nitrogen requirement using compost, you often overload in terms of P and K, which might uh, lead to significant trade-offs in terms of uh, P discharge into the environment. Uh, in terms of soil biology, uh, looking at soil proteins, AMF, and the biomass of soil, uh, the um, uh, percent of soil fungi uh, as measured by PLFA, uh, we see that the organic systems often have higher values than the conventional system. And again, uh, adoption of cover crop in the conventionally managed system, yielding some um, in between results. So, um, now it's kind of important, it's important to start moving away from those properties and to really start relating it to function. And so the goal of a healthy story is to provide a multiple function, which we also often call multifunctionality. Uh, the goal of a healthy soil is to accumulate and store carbon, provide and cycle nutrient, conserve and cycle water, improve soil structure, and support, di support diverse and active soil communities. So we've assembled a list of potential indicators that get at those soil function. And as others have done uh, previously, calculate a multifunctionality index, which refer to the soil capacity to provide all of those function. Um, and in some case, and it has been shown that the multifunctionality of soil can also be related to um, soil biodiversity. So we've calculated um, these multifunctionality index for our data sets um, over time. And uh, a main conclusion here is that adoption of cover crop and compost increase soil ecosystem multifunctionality over time. Uh, if we look at it a little bit more details, you have the conventional system in blue, the mixed system, which is conventional with a cover crop in uh, red and the organic system in green uh, for three main um, uh, time slots in this data set. 1994, so the onset of uh, the experiment in the 2000 and then um, the last few years. And we see that soil ecosystem multifunctionality increases over time, especially in the organic system and especially since 2012. Uh, we observe a decreasing trend under conventional management in terms of the soil ability to provide all those functions. 
Um, and we observe that the mixed system with the cover crop is plateauing and it's probably related to this low ability to store of this practice of cover crop to help store carbon in, in soils in our climates. And so compost application likely underlies improvements in provision of multiple soil ecosystem services. Third observation we've made over the years is that healthy living soil help build our resilience to multiple stresses and that soil microbiomes and the ability of various soil health building practices to shape beneficial microbiomes are very important to build up resilience to multiple stresses. Uh, we've observed this um, in terms of shaping uh, beneficial rhizosphere microbiomes that impact plant resistance to insect pests and using a structural equation model that encompass microbial data both from the soil and the rhizosphere as well as soil health um, indicators and plant uh, indicators of resistance to insect pests such as accumulation of uh, um, uh, salicylic acid um, resulted in um, the conclusion that um, healthy soil, healthy management practices um, that are uh, um, that are central to organic practices help shape beneficial microbiome, which impact the plant's ability to produce salicylic acid, repressing insect pests from um, uh, being attracted by those tomato plants and therefore decreasing the probability that those insects will carry the big curly top virus um, and infect the plant with the big curly top virus. So a direct connection between organic practices, cover crop and compost, um, with shaping beneficial soil communities that communicate with the plan to build up their resistance to insect pests. In terms of abiotic stress, we've conducted a series of deficit irrigation experiments to look at the potential benefits of greater soil health for drought resilience. We found that um, uh, healthy soil provide drought resilience through soil organic matter gains um, and more stable rhizosphere communities. Um, this is an example of some resistance index we've calculated for the conventional and organic system as drought progresses here, um, a deficit irrigation progresses here, you see that um, the bacterial and fungal communities of the soil are more stable. Um, and uh, using a, a, a hierarchical clustering, uh, we're able to um, identify linkages between this resistance in bacterial communities and fungal communities with plant drought resistance indicator. Uh, in this game, in this case, stem water potential. Um, uh, 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 canopy temperature um, and yield when uh, water inputs are suboptimal. So um, a fourth um, observation is that soil health outcomes actually vary with irrigation and water input level. And it's very important to consider this when thinking about building up soil health in our climates. So drip irrigation, has been a, a major drought adaptation technology adopted by many growers. Uh, we used to um, um, uh, irrigate most of our systems using furrow irrigation, and this has been changed to subsurface drip irrigation, where a small tubes, a small tube is being buried in the soil and uh, the water being delivered more precisely to the root zone. Um, that has increased short-term water use efficiency and weed suppression, but it drastically alters soil biology uh, and uh, can degrade very key soil functions uh, that are also uh, that are, um, are critical to uh, ensure water use efficiency, capture of uh, irrigation, uh, capture of precipitation water over the winter, conservation of water more broadly, and carbon storage. So we see here subsurface drip irrigation versus furrow irrigation. This is 
uh, two seasons after switching to drip irrigation, we see huge impact on weed suppression, uh, no real change in terms of yields, but large impact in terms of improving uh, water use efficiency. But we see that subsurface drip irrigation leads to decreasing aggregation and decreasing carbon sequestration, which might um, create um, a cycle of soil degradation. So very important to consider irrigation methodologies and water input level when thinking about building up soil health. So um, finally, when we think about our properties to function, uh, we've seen the, multi, the, the goal of multifunctionality that our healthy soil should fulfill. Um, we should not forget the ability that uh, healthy soil should also support productivity. And so let's take a, a look quickly at yields and yield stability and input use efficiency across those systems. Um, we see that uh, tomato yields are actually more stable in organic system without trade-offs for productivity. Here you see yield stability, mean yield, yield resistance, which is the, the uh, yield resistance to uh, suboptimal growth conditions, and maximum yield potential where conditions are um, optimal. And we see that in the organic system, which is the dotted line here, uh, we have a higher yield stability, similar mean yield over time, higher yield results, resistance, uh, but a, a trade-off under high uh, when, when conditions are optimum uh, to yield high uh, yield potential. So uh, oh, nevertheless, if you take yields over a period of 26 years, there's no differences between those th the, the, the conventional, the conventional with winter cover crops and the organic system. Um, Long-term uh, research experiments have been very interesting to look at these patterns of yield stability across various environment. And this is a recent contribution we've made with, with Tim Bowles and others into putting results from these long-term trials together, uh, showing that rotation diversity enhances yield and probability of high yields, uh, especially under drought. So that's the results we see in our irrigated landscape. Um, and, and we do see some uh, um, aspects of it being translated across um, a, a rainfall gradient across the US. Um, now, if we look again, our three system, organic, conventional with cover crops and conventional and calculate uh, a, a sustainable intensification index that take into account yield, but also nitrogen use efficiency, irrigation use efficiency, pesticide use efficiency, energy use efficiency, the amount of carbon being stored, et cetera. Um, and, and create an index around this that weighs those parameters uh, differently. We find that the organic system is actually the organ adoption of organic management practices such as cover crop and compost provide an opportunity to sustainably intensify those systems. And if we incorporate other crop, the other cropping system of the century experiment into um, this analysis and look at the relationship with soil multifunctionality, we see that we have an opportunity to build win-win scenarios where the ability of our soils to provide multiple ecosystem function um, also uh, uh, positively correlate with sustainable intensification um, and are uh, creating a virtual cycle of being able to produce more with less while taking care of our soils. And uh, you see here the organic maize tomato system being at the forefront of this, um, of creating this win-win scenarios. So in conclusion, um, the use of compost and cover crop can help build up soil health in highly disturbed irrigated system in semi-arid semi climates. Uh, it's important to consider deeper soil layers to be accurate in assessing carbon storage, and this will be a major challenge. Um, to um, uh, to be able to provide growers with carbon with payment for carbon sequestration, um, irrigation practices have been considered uh, have to be considered to maximize potential benefits, and it's going to be very important and remains a major knowledge gap in California to clarify impacts on of of adoption of compost and cover crop on water usage and retentions in our systems. 
We also learned from looking at those long-term data that multifunctional uh, assessment frameworks are useful to build up a relevant narrative for grower and best manage uh, and best management based on understanding benefits and trade-offs for specific objectives, and that we need to extend those functional frameworks to assess impacts of healthy soil with robust statistics. Um, that also address economic performance and include resilience metrics and, and yield stability. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to some discussion during uh, the upcoming panel. And um, uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amelie. It's really nice to hear about a long-term site in an irrigated system and to learn about the multifunctionality and, and sustainability index uh, scores. So that's really fascinating. Um, just a reminder to all the attendees that we will be having a, a panel discussion at the end of all of the presentations. So please keep putting your questions and comments in that chat bar on the right side of your screen. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Dave Huggins. Um, Dr. Huggins is a soil scientist with USDA ARS based in Pullman, Washington, and he's going to be talking to us about the, the Cook Agronomy Farm and the long-term research he's been doing in dryland systems of Eastern Washington. Hello, I'm Dave Huggins, soil scientist and research leader of the USDA ARS Northwest Sustainable Agroecosystems Research Unit in Pullman, Washington. In their 2015 report on the status of the world's soil resources, the United Nations FAO identified the main soil degradation processes that are seriously threatening soil resources. Number one is soil erosion, followed by declining soil organic matter, soil sealing, nutrient imbalances, and acidification. Globally, we are in the midst of a quiet crisis. As rivers brown with sediment from our topsoil flow out to sea, where do we hear the public outcry? Where do we read about the tremendous topsoil loss from soil erosion processes and the associated depletion of soil organic matter? Worldwide, the thin dark line of topsoil is what we depend on for our survival and for a healthy planet. Wendell Berry stated that what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. And Franklin D. Roosevelt is credited for saying, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Soil degradation is driven by our actions. It represents the exploitation and depletion of natural capital. Your natural capital is what we and all life depend on. The air that we can breathe, water that we can drink, soil that is healthy and can produce food. We have a paradox. Degradation and depletion of natural capital continues even though we are at the height of our scientific knowledge and technological skills. Clearly, our biophysical science is not enough. We really need to incorporate human dimensions into our thinking. One research effort, the National USDA Long-Term Agroecosystem Research or LTAR Network, is grappling with increasing our understanding of biophysical and social economic complexities. Under the umbrella of sustainable agricultural intensification, we are expanding our consideration and quantification of what are called ecosystem services. These services range from the production of food to outcomes regarding clean air and water, healthy soil, a healthy planet, and healthy people. As scientists, our major role is to assess trade-offs and synergies that result from our agricultural activities. What are the outcomes from biophysical as well as social economic perspectives? The USDA LTAR network was initiated in 2012 with a selection of 10 locations nationally. The Washington State University Cook Agronomy Farm was one of these 10 original sites. Currently, the network consists of 18 locations with further expansion anticipated. The WSU Cook Agronomy Farm was initiated in 1998 as farmer and research interest was growing to assess spatial and temporal variability of various field scale outcomes. Notice the yellow georeferenced locations, over 600 of them in the field to the right, where multiple outcomes are monitored and assessed over time, all to help inform precision agricultural strategies and to take a more field scale approach to assessing 
long-term continuous direct seed management. The LTR also has a regional footprint that includes research relevant to the dryland cropping regions of Northeast Oregon, Eastern Washington, and Northern Idaho. In 2017, the Cook Agronomy Farm LTAR expanded to include a paired watershed research approach where business as usual treatment could be compared to a more aspirational treatment. Currently, the business as usual consists of a reduced tillage system that uses a common crop rotation and uniform field application of agrochemicals. The aspirational system consists of continuous no tillage and the use of precision agriculture strategies for end fertilizer management. From soil health perspective, research of the Cook Agronomy Farm LTAR includes management impacts on soil erosion, soil organic matter, soil acidification, nutrient imbalances, and soil biological diversity. Here you can see the long-term trends of estimated rates of soil erosion in the Plews Hills and its relation to, to what can be considered, considered tolerable, the USDA soil loss tolerance or T-value, as well as an estimate of the current soil formation rate. Note that the soil formation rate is much less than our current T-value, that the current estimated soil erosion rate is higher than tolerable and that current management options to reduce soil erosion to more soil, soil sustainable levels include no tillage and the USDA Conservation Reserve Program or CRP where perennial plantings are used. Both of these options greatly reduce soil disturbance and associated soil erosion. Collectively, these options and others represent the choices that farmers have, the tools in the toolbox to address soil erosion. This is part of our adaptive capacity. Current research of our USDAR's unit includes field assessment of wind erosion and modeling of erosion outcomes that identify regional hotspots. Current research also includes the regional modeling of the soil conditioning index or SCI that estimates management impacts on both soil organic matter and soil erosion. The SCI is currently used for USDA conservation programs. Soil organic matter, about 58% carbon, notably declined by about 50% as native prairie throughout the world was converted to tillage-based agriculture beginning in the mid-1800s. The Bluce region was no exception, and here we see estimates of soil organic matter decline over time. Important to soil health is the establishment of thresholds or targets of what we consider to be healthy. In the case of soil organic matter in the annual cropping region of the Bluce, Research has identified a topsoil level of 3% or greater as a soil organic matter target. Many of our current agricultural fields are below this mark and would be considered unhealthy. Note that options to increase soil organic matter are conversion to low soil disturbance practices like no-till and also farming systems that include more perennials. Research at the Cook Agronomy Farm has followed soil organic carbon changes at multiple georeferenced locations across a 92 acre field from 1998 to 2015, the last sampling date. Here, soil samples consisting of three depth increments, zero to four inches, four to eight, and eight to 12 inches, and then samples by soil horizon down to five feet in the subsoil. Note the differences in soil color of various zero to five foot cores of soil to the right. Soil organic matter in the surface zero to four inches in our aspirational treatment is reaching 3% or greater of the green colors in much of the surface soil, while in the business as usual, continued soil disturbance by tillage that increases soil organic matter decomposition and losses via soil erosion show levels predominantly below 3%. There's considerable discussion in agriculture on soil carbon sequestration. Here, practices like no-till are thought to increase the amount of soil carbon by taking carbon out of the atmosphere as crops fix atmospheric carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas, and then retain the carbon that is returned in unharvested residues and roots to build soil carbon, a win-win scenario. Currently, there is considerable scientific debate on how no-till management impacts stocks of soil seed. Note that carbon stocks are actual quantities of carbon per unit area. So measures are no longer just soil organic matter percentage, but must also include measurements of soil bulk density and soil depth. 
Furthermore, previous research has primarily assessed soil carbon in the topsoil and has largely neglected measurement of subsoil carbon stocks. Here, you can see the impact of continuous no-till on soil carbon stocks in the surface 10 centimeters at three measurement times, 1998, 2008, and 2015. The darker blue colors represent greater soil carbon levels. Note the large field scale variability of soil carbon. So where you sample becomes important and the soil sampling strategies that can actually represent the field become challenging. From 1998, when no-till was initiated to 2008, the surface zero to 10 centimeter stocks or four inches, surface four inches of soil carbon for the field increased. This occurred as a low soil disturbance no-till drill was used and the surface soil developed a carbon enriched zone of partially decomposed organic materials mixed with mineral soil. When we switched to a higher soil disturbing no-till drill after 2008, however, carbon levels in the surface decreased as measured in 2015 and were actually similar to initial soil carbon levels that occurred prior to initially initiating no-till. In 2015, we collected soil samples at the Cook Agronomy Farm georeferenced points from zero to 153 centimeters deep, that's five feet, to evaluate the active soil organic matter, recognizing that soil management primarily impacts the more active or labile constituents of soil carbon. Interestingly, note that the subsoil, that's 30 to 153 centimeters, contains large stocks of active more labile soil seed constituents, and that more of these carbon stocks actually occurred in the subsoil than in the topsoil. When total stocks of carbon in the topsoil and subsoil were considered for the 1998, 2008, and 2015 sample times, we found that initially soil profile stocks of carbon increased from 1998 to 2008, from 156 to 162 megagrams of carbon per hectare. But then soil profile carbon stocks decreased from 2008 to 2015 to levels that were lower than measured in 1998. This occurred as one, carbon stocks first increased in the topsoil, zero to 30 centimeters, from 1998 to 2008, even though subsoil stocks of carbon were decreasing. And two, after switching to a high disturbance no-till drill, surface carbon decreased and subsoil carbon continued to decrease. The decrease in subsoil carbon is attributed to the increase in water infiltration under no-till that in turn increases the potential for more active subsoil carbon constituents to decompose and the more soluble carbon components to leach away. One conclusion is that no-till is not enough. We also need to intensify our agricultural systems to use more water and become less leaky. Another issue impacting soil carbon is the growing global demand for cereal residues and the harvest of wheat straw to meet fiber and feed markets. The removal of wheat straw from the field will negatively impact future levels of soil carbon, as carbon is linearly related to carbon inputs from crop residues. Climate change forecasts are also predicted to negatively, negatively impact regional levels of soil carbon. Here we show that as mean annual temperature, MAT, increases while mean annual precipitation, MAP, remains about the same, the overall climate index, which is a function of MAT divided, M, divided by MAP, increases and drives soil organic carbon levels lower. Soil acidification is another soil health issue that is threatening Palouse region agriculture. Note that as soil pH in the surface foot decreases below 5.7, the yields of first legumes, such as alfalfa peas and lentils, are severely impacted. And then as acidification continues to levels below a soil pH of 5.2, yields of wheat and barley are also negatively impacted. Over time, driven primarily by the use of nitrogen fertilizers, soils throughout the Palouse region have decreased from near neutral, a pH of seven, to in many cases below a pH of 5.5. And this is soil acidification is currently impacting crop yields at an unknown level. Adaptive capacity options include lime applications, which rapidly correct soil pH, but are currently expensive, 
increasing the efficiency of nitrogen fertilizer use, which will slow the soil acidification process and conversion to conservation reserve program plantings that slowly increase soil pH over time. Otherwise, soil pH will continue to decline. At the Cook Agronomy Farm, continuous no-till, as shown on the east field, has stratified soil acidification near the surface as a result of the subsurface banding of applied nitrogen fertilizers. Note that in much of the field, soil pH in the surface four inches is at 5.25 or below. In contrast, on the west field, where nitrogen fertilizer is still deep banded, but where tillage operations mix the soil, the soil pH is higher, though still not at what would be considered healthy levels. Soil acidification is a relatively slow process and understanding field scale changes requires longer term studies. These field maps of the surface four inches show how soil pH has become more acid over time from 1998 to 2015 under continuous no-till. In this case, the orange and red colors indicate more acid soil that has developed over the course of 17 years. Surprisingly, subsoil measures of soil pH reveal that acidification is not just a surface phenomenon. Here, soil acidification of the subsoil was occurring under conventional tillage, particularly in low-lying, less well-drained portions of the field. Under continuous no-till, locations with subsoil acidification were ameliorated over time. This was attributed to increased water infiltration and the movement of soluble bases from the topsoil to the subsoil. So while the surface topsoil was acidifying, the subsoil was actually getting less acid under no tillage. Throughout our research examples from the Cook Agronomy Farm, LTAR, we have linked ecological resilience theory to soil health. To do so, we have established optimums or thresholds for key soil health indicators for soil erosion, soil organic matter decline, and soil acidification. We have monitored where key soil health indicators are in relation to optimums or thresholds and the rate of change towards or away from these thresholds. We have observed the uniqueness of field location and the importance of long-term monitoring, including both topsoil and subsoil, to understand management impacts on soil health indicators. We have also emphasized the importance of increasing adaptive capacity while having more tools in the toolbox and understanding how different management options can impact soil health. A slide I made over 20 years ago regarding future directions still seems relevant. Our agricultural systems much, must continue to evolve toward management strategies that have low soil disturbance, that are site and time specific, that are more diversified and have more options, including perennials that can promote adaptive capacity, that are resilient, that are resilient and able to recover and remain healthy following various stresses, biophysical and social economic, and that we all must continue to be open-minded learners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Huggins, for that excellent presentation. Um, another good example of how long-term sites like that one can really help us track soil properties that change slowly over time and look at um, aspects of sustainability and resilience. Um, so our final speaker in this session is Dr. Sarah Evans. Um, Dr. Evans is an associate professor with Michigan State University is going, and is going to be talking with us about um, the research she's doing at the Kellogg Biological Station in Michigan. So looking forward to hearing from Dr. Evans. Hi, my name is Sarah Evans. I'm an associate professor of biology at Kellogg Biological Station, which is part of Michigan State University. I'm going to talk about optimizing soil services in Midwest agriculture. And I'm telling you now, this is the last time I'm going to restart this recording because my childcare ends soon. So it has to be. So here we go. Thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me um, for this uh, talk. I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. I first want to acknowledge my contributors to this research. Um, I, I'm not going to name everyone's names, but all this research was done with the contributions of the KBS long-term ecological research team, some of it before I even came along. I'll introduce my kind of framework for thinking about soil health first. Um, so usually we think of soil health as providing services. 
And historically, we've thought of soil as made up of chemical factors and those services to be restricted to yield. That's what we're primary concerned with. And it's a really exciting time to be part of soil health uh, movement because soil, both of the sides of these equations have expanded. So we now think of soil and all its complexity, its wonderful complexity um, in terms of chemical, biological, physical factors, all those factors, not just chemical. And then importantly, the interaction of those factors. Um, and then the services is also expanded, which soils always provided these services, but now we just kind of can acknowledge them a lot more explicitly from water quality to climate mitigation. I work at the Kellogg Biological Station long-term ecological research site, and if you're not familiar with the LTER network, it was explicitly um, created to do long-term research and site-based research. So there's sites all over the U.S. KBS is the only agricultural site. Um, and I just want to highlight, uh, as other speakers I'm sure in this session will also do, but long-term research is really needed to understand slow processes, and a lot of those are applied to soil. Um, to understand episodic or infrequent events, like those happening under climate change, long-term trends or time lags, like seeing the benefit of certain management, um, and then also the interaction of certain processes and the trade-offs of different services, which I'll get to later. So in the past 30 years at the LTER, um, KBS has been measuring a lot of these services, and they usually put it in the context of ecosystem services, um, but the majority of them are soil services and are related to soil health. So to provide a little context um, in the Midwest, the what, what has really been a motivating question is how can we recover the soil carbon losses that have occurred in the last 40 to 60 years of, of cultivation of North America? Um, so there's potential to recover a lot of the carbon that's been lost, but the question is, you know, how much can we recover? What's the rate and to what depth? The other context I'll, I'll um, just mention is just kind of what we're looking at for climate change in this area. And, you know, I always zoom into my area on these maps so you can look for your area. I'm zooming in on rainfall because I'm going to talk about this later. But really, we're looking at kind of a change in timing of rainfall in the Midwest and the Northeast. Longer periods of dry days on the left, shown on that graph. And then on the right, um, heavier precipitation. So more of our water is going to fall in heavy events. The KBS LTER site is really set up as kind of a, a gradient of land uses. So we have a lot of different experiment, experiments and a lot of different management uh, treatments. So we go from annual crops to perennial crops, a lot of which are proposed, used, proposed to be used for biofuels, and then conservation and semi-natural lands, including restored prairies. The experiment I'll zoom in on um, sort of explicitly sets up this gradient. So we go from conventional, conventionally managed agriculture, uh, corn, soy, reet rotation um, that's tilled and with high inputs um, to moving to, to less intense management. So no till, and then we have a reduced input plot, which has a third of the inputs with cover crops, organic treatment with cover crops, and then perennial treatments, so one that's trees of poplar and one that's um, herbaceous with alfalfa. Um, and then we have conservation lands, so those are either uh, early successional lands or, or prairies. So I'm first going to um, present a few results just from sort of 30 years of these treatments on the main cropping system experiment. And then what I'm going to do is sort of move into some data, but a little bit arm wavy of where I think are some exciting frontiers in this area. Um, so first at our site, this graph just shows yield, a good, a good place to start in terms of services. Um, this is plotted relative to the conventional plot. So conventional agriculture, which was about national means of a typical corn, soy, wheat rotation. Um, how do the other lower input or, or less intense treatments do? Well, they do pretty well. So you can see for corn, soy, and wheat, um, the no-till was higher in yield. And so we achieved that greater yield. And then the reduced inputs were higher or a little bit lower. 
And I'll note two things about this graph. Um, first, the lesser yield of the biologically based system uh, is likely due to nitrogen limitation, particularly in wheat, which didn't follow a nitrogen fixing cover crop like corn. So that's where we're getting sort of the yield, yield fall. Um, and then secondly, in another study, Sarah Cusser and Nick Haddad showed that um, it took no-till about 10 to 15 years to see the same benefit that we've detected after 29 years. So in other words, it's, it's sort of a, t um, a testament to the value of long-term research where um, the benefit of no-till, all the services that it's providing, would not necessarily have been apparent from a shorter-term study. So I see that as valuable, um, not only ecologically, but also just in showing you know, farmers how long it takes to achieve some of the benefits of no-till. Moving on to another soil service, um, nitrate loss and groundwater recharge. I'm not showing groundwater recharge here, but here is the whole gradient from more intense on the left to less intense on the right, and the um, how much nitrate loss occurs through leaching. So as we expect, we get really high in con conventional and, and lower as lower inputs um, and poorer or, or better soil health. So here, low, low is good. Um, so let's see, so we see like a threefold difference across these management um, treatments, which is really large and shows just the power of, you know, changing management effect on, on leaching. Just want to point out perennials really low and cover crops also have a really big effect on um, nitrate loss. The final service I'll show from our long-term um, our long-term data set is global warming impact. So here I've decided not to show the different components of global warming impact. Like we've measured N2O production, uh, methane production, CO2 production um, from the soils, and then also carbon sequestration. This is kind of integrated into one. So a higher is a higher global warming impact and then negative sort of a global warming benefit um, or overall sequestration. So. Um, we see that the conventional crops are actually harming global warming, so we don't want that. Um, but we do see some uh, some benefit of the no-till, the reduced input, and especially the biologically based. That's kind of when this organic treatment uh, really shines in this uh, potential to to mitigate climate. So I know I sped through those and I'm gonna sped speed through this sort of trade-off as well, but this is really just to show you some of the things that we can do with long-term research and in measuring multiple things at one site. Um, because now we can kind of put it all together and say, you know, what are the trade-offs in terms of services and in terms of the management regimes that we're doing to optimize soil health. And so this is, these are just, um, graphs that show the services along the outside of the, um, I guess that's a, I don't know, pentagon, hexagon, um, and, and then graphing each one by the line. So I think that really what I want to summarize here is that there's no clear overall winner, but there is a lot of other services other than yield that we can optimize without too much cost. So, um, there's trade-offs that are positive and negative, but really in the end, we find no-till, um, cover crops, and sort of sometimes reduced fertilizer to have these really large inputs at not too much cost. So here's just sort of a comparison of those. So this was written up formally in a couple of papers in the last few years um, that you can, you can look through and Really, the takeaway is that many soil services other than yield could be provided now at really minimal cost and sometimes in a win-win scenario. Um, No-till and cover crops came out on, on top. They really can achieve more services without sacrificing yield. Reduced input and biologically based is really only a moderate reduction for some pretty um, beneficial services. Um, but doing so is going to require targeting to provide synergies and optimizing trade-offs at appropriate scales. Um, and then also a socio-ecological context in order to deploy effectively. So I think 
I mean, depending on who this audience is, this may not be a surprise to you um, that no-till and cover crops are kind of, you know, shown to benefit both the farmer and the yields and the prosperity of the farmer and a lot of other ecosystem services. Um, and so I think this is really impactful and has kind of helped us accept that as, as a new paradigm. Um, and that's why I present it to you today. But I also, you know, want to note that I think a lot of us are now acknowledging that sometimes the science isn't holding back adoption in this case. And we have some sociological research going on alongside of this ecological research that's looking into that. Um, there's been, I could highlight a lot of studies, but a current study that's going on in my own lab by Taylor Ulbrich, a graduate student, she's looking into barriers to soil health practice adoption. So um, if we see these win-wins for, for, for uh, supporting soil health, why aren't more people adopting it? So from our long-term term survey that Sandy Marquot-Piot uh, conducted, we found that 72% of farmers say that healthy soils increase yield. So they sort of know that this, that, that soil health can be beneficial to them, but only 46% take steps to improve soil health. So Taylor is looking into um, how farmers conceive soil, the idea of soil health. And she hypothesizes that because it's this broad abstract topic with many factors, which we highlighted as a strength at the beginning, that it's challenging for farmers to identify concrete strategies to improve soil health. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm actually gonna highlight just a few um, you know, newer avenues that our uh, KBS LTER is starting to investigate in the last few years. And those are um, not only continuing sociological research, but also thinking about resilience to climate change and that as an additional soil service, and then landscape diversity. So first, we've started to show that healthy soils maintain services under climate change, and I'll argue that if it's not already, it should be an additional service around that um, circle. That now that we're, we're seeing climates changing so much, this added resilience is harder to measure. It takes more, um, more data to measure, but it's gonna be on equal footing with a lot of those services. So we've been measuring this with rain out shelters and with observational data. So first, just to, um, because we have this long-term data set, we were able to, to pick out or to kind of be around for extreme years. And 2012 was one of those extreme years. There was a really big drought um, there was, and there were large reductions in yields. Um, and this was a soybean year. So in conventional, you know, we have reductions in yields across the board, but it was very obvious that no-till um, did not have reduced yields as much. And so we looked into it, this was really because there was this more water storage right before the drought. So if we look at um, the, the soil moisture leading up to the drought, it's all going down, but this no-till treatment was able to kind of maintain a higher soil moisture and that's what contributed to the resilience. So we're looking into a kind of a more mechanistic view of this about what exactly about the soil um, made it able to, to hold more water and how deep did that go. Um, but we're kind of trying to, to elucidate that a little bit and expand that as a service. The second thing I'll, I'll highlight is nitrogen retention. So this goes back to those um, climate predictions that I showed that showed that we're going to have bigger rain events. And this is big for nitrogen retention, both in terms of nitrate lost from down below, so through leaching into our water system, and then also lost through N2O, through denitrification. That's a really big point when microbes go anoxic and um, produce a lot of N2O and N2. So here I'll just highlight the, the leaching part. And this graph shows um, the bars show precipitation, where on the left, precipitation fell every two to three days in small events. So that's those little tick marks. And then on the right, we have fewer big events. This is manipulated with rain out shelter. Uh, nitrate leaching is shown with the blue line on the second y-axis. So what this shows, this is showing the, the tilled conventional treatment. When precipitation is intensified, as we expect it to do in the future, um, we saw leaching more than double. It went really high. 
um, just from this change in timing, not a change in amount. But interesting, we interestingly we oops. Let me pause. Sorry, resuming. Interestingly, we did not see that in the no-till treatment. So basically what the no-till graph shows is that we have some loss um, in kind of typical rainfall patterns and then about the same in intensified patterns. So basically what this says to me, and we see something similar with N2O, where we see this huge spike of N2O when we intensify rainfall and we don't see that spike um, when in, in no-till or in, in this case perennial treatments. So to me, this is this is important because this is going to be a new reality in the future. And it's sort of an undocumented benefit of some of these um, managements and some of these improvements to soil. The second avenue I want to highlight is um, how landscape diversity can enhance soil health. Um, so this is not a new idea in general. We've been talking about buffer strips and hedgerows for a long time in agriculture, but it's new to our KBS LTER, and I don't see it much in conversations about soil health. Um, so here I show images from an experiment led by Lisa Schulte Moore and collaborators at Iowa State, um, and they've published on this for probably up to 20 years by now. So you should look up this experiment and the many papers that have come out of it. Um, and here you see H flumes that show how much soil sediment is not lost just uh, when you just include 10% of the land as prairie. So these little schematics show how much of the cropland is is sort of planted by prairie. So here is just a simple um, treatment of having a prairie strip um, within the the agriculture crop. And so she showed that you get a lot less soil loss. And here this is on a slope and a very wet system. Um, but I think that a really neat part of this experiment is that capturing these sorts of images that farmers can see has really increased adoption. And they've also worked with farmers from the beginning and, and been able to discover things like the fact that farmers really like um, seeing prairies on their field. They feel like, you know, it's, it's natural, it's native, and um, they feel good about it. And if it's enhancing their services of their farm, even better. Um, so Corinne Rudkowski in my lab is involved in this experiment at our site in Michigan. Okay, so there's Corinne. Um, and she's really interested in how strips confer microbial benefits to surrounding cropland and also how they remove things like neonicotinoids from the soil. So that might be an additional service that strips are providing to kind of adjacent cropland nearby. So those are just uh, kind of some things I'll highlight and I'll close with where do we where do we go from here? Um, so some closing thoughts, I think incorporating climate or economic resilience as an additional soil health service on that wheel of services is going to be important because it's going to be, become um, more relevant as climates change. Um, considering landscape heterogeneity could be a future avenue of research. Um, not only can adjacent land benefit soil health, but we could also look into precision agriculture um, where there's different, you know, different levels of soil health within a single crop field. Um, and then I think there's a lot of potential, which others probably will acknowledge of co-production with farmers. There's a lot of novel practices out there that might need measurement and a lot of knowledge um, that farmers have acquired. Um, and I think it increases the potential for adoption as well as imp improves our science. So thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Evans. Um, so now we're going to, we've had quite a lot of uh, questions come in through the, the chat forum. And so we'll have a panel discussion now with our um, with our panelists. So looks like everyone is here. Um, well, I'll talk, uh, I'll start with a few specific questions about some of your presentations. And then I also want to discuss, you know, 
ways in which there's similarities and differences among all of these long-term sites. Um, starting with Dr. Paulison, um, and actually this is a question that would be interesting for all of you to answer. For these long-term studies, have you tried to estimate the magnitude of rhizodeposition um, of carbon from exudates, root turnover, below ground organic matter deposition? Okay, I'll go for that. At our sites, generally not directly, um, you know, to, to actually um, measure riser deposition, people can do that with carbon-14 labelling, is quite tricky to do. We haven't done that. What we have done, well, not me, but colleagues have done, is to try to estimate how much carbon is coming into the soil from a total of um, stubble root and root exudates, and this is uh, built into our modelling efforts and so on. So we've got sort of figures for how much carbon is coming into the soil in total from a crop um, uh, you know, at different levels of production. I can't remember the numbers, but not directly looking at rising deposition. Yeah, I know that's a very challenging thing to, to measure. Um, Amelie, is that something your lab has done? I know you focus a lot on roots. Well, um... We've done it in pots in the greenhouse, but not necessarily in the field quite yet. So uh, no, we haven't, especially at, at Russell Ranch, yeah. I'll make just a comment then. You know, I, I think this is another example of how really difficult it is to track carbon in our soil. And I'm, I'm thinking about the earthworm activity, the economy farm and the drillosphere and, and the fact that, you know, I can take a cross-sectional area of soil down at uh, you know two meters, uh, and look at the earthworm channels that are going out through the bottom of that. Each of them coated with organic materials, <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I'm not even sampling these soils correctly from the perspective of what's really going on in terms of carbon at some of these you know smaller scale scales associated with the drill spheres, associated with the rhizosphere, et cetera. And I'm looking at a, a bulk stab, you know, that's trying to integrate across of those, but yet is that representative of what's really going on? And as our soils become more heterogeneous, you know, through the use of perennials and through low disturbance systems, that degree of soil variability only increases and becomes more and more of a challenge. Yeah, certainly. Sarah, any any thoughts on rhizodeposition or we haven't measured it, but that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely a challenging thing to, to quantify, but uh, we all recognize its importance. Um, let's see, um, for Dr. Paulson, there was a question from Peter. Um, in all of the discussion of soil carbon sequestration, um, there's little acknowledgement of ocean outgassing. Uh, whereby oceans will equilibrate at least for a time with re um, any reduction in atmospheric CO2. Any comments on that? Sure. Uh, not really. This is outside my area of expertise. I, mean, I think I, I think it's a it sounds like it's a reasonable mechanism. And of course, in terms of the opposite of sequestration, um, you know, the oceans do take up a lot of carbon um, uh, at the moment. Um, a lot of um, you know, a lot of carbon deposited deep um, into the uh, into the oceans. Um, so yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it's a possible yeah. You know, the mechanism proposed of outgassing if you uh, reduce CO two in the atmosphere is sure is possible. Um, but um, I, I I'm just not competent to to comment on that. But for sure, we we really got to even if that is going to happen, it seems to me we really have got to cut down. We've got to cut the CO2 in the atmosphere somehow, which I think has actually mostly got to be done through enormous reductions in emissions. I think we can do a, a bit through sequestering in land, but not nearly as much as is uh, as some people sort of claim or think they can. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll just mention, I know we're almost at 11.30, which is the end of the session, but we've had lots of good questions and we want to have time for discussion. So we are going to keep going if you can um, stay with us um, to all the attendees. Um, let's see, a question for Amelie um, from Tamiras. In or the organic systems, it showed a depletion of magnesium in the soils. And um, the person was curious about why you think that might be. <laughs> 
Deidre, do you have any idea? You've worked there as well. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm unsure. That's something that we've been wrestling with, and, and I don't think we have a very good mechanistic answer to that. Um, it's probably linked to compost application versus mineral fertilizer that leads to some imbalance in, in mineral nutrition. Uh, we see this with pea overload, for instance, with some difference in calciums as well. So I think those nutrient imbalances are due to trying to meet nitrogen requirement using compost. And so you end up overloading in some nutrients and, and um, having deficiencies in others. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my thought as well. Um, for our other panelists that have been working with amendments on the long-term sites, have you observed any other similar things with nutrient imbalances? I can't think of a specific example there. I mean, there are funny things you do have to watch. So for example, I mean, I think we've, we've seen times when um, some certain manures contain a lot of copper. Um, certainly pig, pig manure could, I think probably not so much now, but in the past, pigs were given copper salts, I think, uh, for various reasons. So you could get unexpected metals coming in but I don't, I'm not aware of, of this imbalance in this way. Yeah, I'll just mention for us, you know, it's it's not so much amendments, but uh, the continued acidification of our soil, which definitely impacts both macro and micronutrients and their availability to, to crops. And also, you know, kind of the specter of aluminum toxicity as well, which is, which is something that we're grappling with right now. So, you know, from that standpoint, pH is a, you know, hugely important indicator <laughs> from the perspective of, you know, maintaining good uh, nutrition in our crops. Right. Yeah, if, uh, that's absolutely true. On our grassland long-term experiment, I didn't talk about it at all today, we have uh, plots that have got become very acid due to, a, well, either nitrogen fertilizer or indeed to some extent acid deposition from the atmosphere, both. And some of those have become very acid and indeed aluminium um, are being released from, from soil minerals and taken up in the crops or and taken up in the herbage. Uh, this is very, very noticeable indeed in extreme cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually did have a question from Devin for um, Dave, whether you are seeing aluminum toxicity or phosphorus deficiency issues in those soils. Yeah, well, it's a good question. And, um, you know, we're kind of grappling with that in, in terms of trying to, to set, you know, some of those thresholds at what, you know, point in terms of, of um, extractable aluminum and, and much of it, the soil test is around KCL extractable aluminum. At what point do we, you know, consider to be something that's really detrimental to our crops, kind of establishing a threshold. And of course, also important in terms of a measure is just how much of the aluminum is on our exchange complex. That is the kind of exchange complex of the soil associated with organic matter and clays. And what percentage of that exchange complex is comprised of, of aluminum? And so those, those fact, we are definitely seeing it and, you know, but it's a difficult thing to assess somewhat because of the stratification we have in our soil. In other words, if much of this aluminum toxicity is occurring in the top four inches, it might, and it might impact, you know, the early growth of our crops, you know, germination establishment of our crops more so than perhaps uh, later on in the season when that portion of the soil is actually dried out and much of our crops are drawing water from you know, deeper in the soil profile itself. And it might have impacts on our, our spring crops, much like uh, Dr. Paulson was talking about, you know, where they have to get going, you know, quite aggressively early on. And if they have a factor like aluminum that's inhibiting some of their growth early on, and that could definitely impact their yield. And some of our winter crops like winter wheat, again, might be able to outgrow through this type of stratification that's occurring and not impact, impact so much. So this becomes, you know, just like everything, a complicated <laughs> type of question to try to, to answer. And also there's tremendous spatial variability in terms of soil pH. Order of two pH units are typical in field, in a given field that you may find. And so, so this phenomena is something that's quite hard to grapple with in terms of, of even sampling to know what kinds of acidifications occurring, you know, throughout your field. And you noticed the thing with depth too, which was just almost terrifying when I first saw that, oh my gosh, there's acidification down at five feet and how are we gonna correct that, you know? And in our soils, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately we're losing bases and this gets back to the nutrition issue, but these leaky systems, 
uh, we were estimating, you know, on the back of envelopes that we would basically uh, leach all of our bases away in the course of the next 100 years at the rate that they're leaving the field right now. <laughs> and I think globally, um, in some areas, um, uh, soil acidification is, uh, is an issue that's quite often overlooked. Again, I, I, I've worked with uh, colleagues in China quite a bit, not, not on that topic myself, but other people have looked at the city for soil acidification in China, where the, the use of nitrogen fertilizer has gone up enormously over the last few decades. And this is, you know, this is documented as leading to soil um, acidification. And it's often not been recognized. And although I, I guess in North America and certainly in Europe, we've got a long history of, of liming as a fairly normal thing to do to our soils, um, in, in good parts of China, this is not um, the tradition. And so, um, so this can be a sort of a, almost a hidden source of yield loss and, of, you know, and indeed, if you like, of soil quality deterioration. Yeah. A question for all of you, you know, as we've been talking about soils changing over time and dealing with issues like acidification, you know, in these long-term sites, how do you adapt to issues like that that might come up um, as a result of specific treatments and, you know, adaptation and building and flexibility to kind of keep up with how farmers are also also changing their practices. Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you want <laughs> to tackle that question first? I was curious of asking that of the other panelists too, because that's kind of a persistent challenge we have with long-term research is you want to give the treatment management um, a long time to and not like change it every year because then you don't have a long-term record, but you also want to stay with the times and be representative and relevant. Um, so I, I don't know, I think with ours, we sort of just balance that, keep some long. And then if, if it's not serving us or it's outdated, you know, we might change it because there's also so much value in looking at a land use transition. Um, but I think the other thing is probably recently we sort of are studying this with multiple like well, multiple funding sources and multiple goals, kind of multiple time scales. So I think with some that are maybe more closer, more, more close to the applied side of like answering questions um, of specific treatments um, and, you know, kind of field trials might be more changeable because it's so important that it's relevant to current practices, but maybe some others that we're looking at mechanisms, um, it might be more important to wait that 30 years to see what happens with organic carbon, just to understand how it accumulates. So I think there's kind of, I mean, hopefully you have enough to, to address both, but I think it just kind of depends on the questions and um, you know, how close like the, you know, the gradient between sort of fundamental questions and like applied questions. But I'd be curious what other people say. It's been a, a challenge certainly in, across long-term experiments. And um, I think um, at, at Russell Ranch in the century experiment, we also have the structure of the plot that is large enough to allow for some micro plots on the side. So some things can be changed on the margin of each plot without uh, compromising long-term data acquisition on, on some beds in the, in the centers of plots. So that's, you know, the the founder of this experiment kind of thought about this um, and that's that's a blessing. But um, definitely, um, I think a, a steady stream of, of funding would really help because right now we're just struggling to keep this long-term experiment. We're going with, with the wind and with the flow and trying to keep consistency in a changing world um, where pri research priorities shift very quickly. Um, and our challenges are more on the long term. So we want to keep relevant uh, while uh, being uh, you know, accurate in our long-term data acquisition. So it's a real challenge for managing those this, this experiments. Um, definitely, like you mentioned, Sarah, there's some systems that are less relevant now, um, especially at restaurants, the wheat systems. Some of the wheat systems are understudied by um, professors and students. And so, so it's hard to keep them going as well because there's a cost associated with, with keeping those, those plots. Um, but um, 
In our case, I mean, the century experiment is interesting because it's not representative of the practices out there in some ways. Uh, there's no typical rotation in California. You have 400 crops. Uh, a farmer might go from basil to amaranth to tomatoes. There's no way we can replicate that. So it's about management approaches rather than really trying to replicate what can happen in the field. And that really adds to some more participatory approaches that we might work um, directly with growers or in, grow, in growers' fields. So we have slightly a different lens on to the design and, and um, adaptive design of this experiment. Yeah, I can comment. I mean, we, we've grappled with exactly the same issues on our long-term experiments. And I think over, well, most of my working life, we've, um, the philosophy has been, um, first of all, to be multidisciplinary. So any decision making is multidisciplinary. We, we've got a committee of people involving all the different disciplines we have at Rothamsted, um, you know, soil scientists and plant pathologists and weed experts, and all of these things, uh, to review how the things are going. And um, there's two things. We, the decision has really been made to try to keep many of the treatments uh, somewhat up to date and somewhat relevant to um, current agriculture in our region. Um, it's always a few years behind because we don't want to be changing all the time. So we review the, the, um, the, the well, particularly the wheat variety, probably about every five years. Um, so the, that's a change which happens, but we decided that's a necessary one. Um, and various um, there are agrochemicals have been brought in at different times, fungicides and so on. Although again, fortunately our plots were big enough to divide up. So we've kept some parts with no fungicides and no herbicides, which are sort of in a sense, very scientifically important and interesting, but not so relevant. Um, and again, we review the treatments occasionally. And so we have dropped out some treatments, which after a lot of thought, we decided are not so interesting and put in some extra ones. So for example, you know, we've increased the number of the, the, the range of nitrogen rates because these, this seemed to be necessary to do that because we weren't getting sort of maximum yields with the rates that we had. So in order to, to bring in one new treatment, you've got to drop another one. So we do a lot of heart searching over these things, but that's been our philosophy to try to keep relevant but um uh but also uh, keep keep the continuity as well but it's a it's a tussle dr huggins do you have any any thoughts on that as well so much has been said i'll just re-emphasize that you know particularly you know issues of scale become important and you can you know, assess things that we've tried to tackle some of the more field scale kinds of, of outcomes with respect to, you know, different kinds of practices. But, but in your research portfolio, you really need to, to have a, a multiple scales that are represented. And, and in some cases, like was mentioned by Emily, you can, you can embed micro you know, studies within, you know, these landscapes, these larger field kinds of, of uh, treatments and to test various kinds of, of short term and highly relevant often <laughs> kinds of, of research um, that can be impactful. And also I just wanna emphasize that, you know, the, the co-innovation that can occur when you have satellite studies working hand in hand with other farmers becomes really important. And having, they, many farmers now have the wherewithal to do on-farm research quite well and to answer some of the questions that, they're, that are most prominent in their minds. And so, you know, having a, a basically in a research portfolio, you know, this satellite type of, 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 um, of, um, of research that's ongoing that can help you stay connected to what the questions are from a research perspective, but also be highly relevant to what farmers are thinking about in terms of testing various kinds of, of questions that they, they currently have is important. Yeah. Well, I can add to that. I, mean, I completely agree. I think it's important not to try to do everything within your long term experiment. You just can't. Uh, you'll never satisfy everybody and you'll just fall down all over the place. So certainly we um, we don't try to do that. So, yeah, we have you know, other experiments that are not long term looking at specific things and you know, participatory work with farmers is, is another approach as well. Yeah, thank you for all those thoughts. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, the Washington Soil Health Initiative, part of that is setting up long-term sites. So I'm actually part of a group tasked with setting up a long-term site in Western Washington. And we were grappling with a lot of these things. How do we be representative, but you know, focus the questions and, and build in flexibility. So 
thank you for all those, those helpful thoughts. Um, another question for all of you, um, Marcos asked about your thoughts on paying farmers for carbon sequestration. You know, carbon storage was covered in, in all of your talks. And so I wondered if you could, could comment on that. And then we also have a question from Patrick um, related to that, you know, how, what public policies do you see as, um, you know, that could best stimulate adoption of some of these practices for, for building soil carbon and soil health? You know, that's a big question. <laughs> I'll just make a comment regarding carbon. And I, I think this is something many people have, have grappled with for quite a while. And there were some very good presentations today, I think that really illustrated some of the issues you're facing. And part of it is just, well, how much? <laughs> and what's the validation to, to actually show how much carbon that you've actually sequestered? And, and then the dynamic nature of it, that it could be lost <laughs> you know, in a matter of years if management changes, right? And so, you know, Dr. Paulson mentioned nitrogen and, and this is something for the last almost 20 years that I've been <laughs> talking about. We really should be talking to much more about nitrogen from the perspective of climate change and what agriculture can do with respect to greenhouse gases. And nitrogen becoming more efficient is a gift that keeps on giving, <laughs> okay? We become more efficient than we, take N2O nitrous oxide, a potent greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and agriculture is a main you know, source of that uh, greenhouse gas. And so really we should be talking much more about nitrogen. I think from a carbon sequestration perspective and, and greenhouse gas and carbon trading, it's fraught with trying to, to actually quantify and maintain uh, the kinds of, of levels and validate what's out there. And, um, and uh, Furthermore, I think much of the value when I see it is not so much in the carbon itself, but you know, when we go to low disturbance systems, no-till, the erosion in our case that we're preventing is the main, you know, very, very positive outcome of that particular practice. And that should be recognized and noted, and we should be paid for that. <laughs> you know, in terms of if you're going to be paid for anything in our circumstance, it should be for some very positive outcomes that are coming. And I suspect this is true for, you know, various kinds of ecosystem services that are out there in terms of how they're valued. We really should look at the broad spectrum of what our agriculture is delivering or not delivering and reward farmers for providing some of these in some very useful ways. So green payments, yes. Um, our situation in California is interesting because we've had um, huge incentive from the state uh, for climate change mitigation and adaptation through building soil carbon. So we have a healthy soil program. Most of the cap and trade money is being redistributed for climate change adaptation and mitigation to uh, incentivize adoption of those carbon building uh, management uh, strategies. So. We have um, uh, a lot the policies in place. Um, what I'm more concerned about is whether they're really evidence-based because if we look at the results we have, um, for the most that I don't want to say that cover crop might not be very effective in building up soil carbon. I think this is what we see. And, um, and so where do we go from there? Um, there's no doubt that there's also other co-benefit as you mentioned, David, um, that, that could be uh, recognize and really push to um, really sustain agriculture as part of the solution to climate change. I think there's there's also adaptation to climate change in, in the picture as well. So um, I think it's really challenging to hinge a lot of this on carbon. Um, and that's maybe there's other co-benefits that could be, um, and I, I hate to say monetized because it's not the right word, but um, that, <laughs> that could be valued in some ways uh, for, for growers because they do more than just sequestering carbon. It's about retaining nitrogen, it's about providing um, habitat for biodiversity, et cetera, that those conservation practices can help too. So um, in our climate, semi-arid climate, the carbon benefits of some of those practices is really difficult to quantify and really uncertain. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with all the things that, that others have said, if I may say so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, measure actually measuring or validating how much soil carbon has changed is difficult. 
for all of the spatial variability issues that, that, that David Huggins uh, talked about, because um, you're looking at small changes and spatially variable ones. Um, uh, to some extent, you can perhaps um, get figures. You could rely on models. You know, we know. You know, we've done a lot of modelling of soil carbon changes. So, to, to some extent, we could, with some confidence, say if you do this practice on this soil type in this climate region, soil carbon over 20 years or something will change by so much. That's a possible approach. I fully agree with what David said about nitrogen. I really think that we're. Um, we, we almost end up putting too much emphasis on soil carbon. Soil carbon is important for, for soil health and soil quality for all of those things. Of course it is. But um, in terms of climate change, I think we can do much better with nitrogen. As I said in my talk, we've got so many, um, manage, um, so many tools available now to manage nitrogen better. Um, and that's got a big uh, greenhouse gas um, impact. But, and the other thing I think to be, we have to be quite clear that um, that things that are good for carbon are sometimes bad for nitrous oxide. Um, so there's been some work which shows that, that, that zero till um, is, is usually good for soil carbon, not as, as big an effect as often is claimed, but in some um, environments, soil types, weather situations, it can lead to more nitrous oxide being evolved. So you've really got to look out for things like that. Uh, and not just say a blanket, yes, so zero till is always good. And cover crops, I mean, again, I think cover crops, I mean, we in, in the European Union, cover crops have been mandated um, for nitrate, for mopping up nitrate during the winter when they would otherwise be leached. But yes, they're also good for carbon where, where you could fit them into the cropping um, system. But there was some modeling done um, suggesting that if you had if you had cover crops over a good many years, this will build up the organic nitrogen in the soil, give you more mineralization and probably more nitrous oxide. Um, so there are plenty of trade-offs that make things a bit messy. Um, I, I, as I keep saying, I, I worry that we're putting too much emphasis on what can be done for carbon sequestration within agricultural soils and somehow mix, mixing that up with the, the other two big things, which is maintaining the carbon that we've got in our forests and our wetlands and so on. Um, you know, avoid losing that carbon. Um, uh, I, I would put as much emphasis on that as, as I would the, the, the agricultural part, I think. I'll just add that we at KBS, there is about five, 10 years ago, there's a lot of work on um, quantifying nitrate, nitrous oxide emissions and then trying to convert it so it can be used in carbon markets, um, just converting it to kind of carbon equivalent of sequestration. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think some of the most striking finding is just that it's not surprising, but nitrous oxide can be pretty well predicted by amount of inorganic nitrogen in the soil. And that's kind of a bonus for it too, because it's maybe it's can actually be quantified easier. Maybe you don't have to go out every three days and measure nitrous oxide, you know, trace gas emissions. Maybe you can develop something that can be um, quantified and then incentivized with just like more precision, um, like variable rate fertilizer or just, you know, more efficient fertilizer addition. So, but yeah, I echo everything people said about, about carbon. It's a good question. Thank you all. Well, um, we're getting close to the to the end here, and I, I just want to ask uh, one more question, um, a question from Craig. How important is it to look at farming as a system versus individual specific practices? Um, the importance of diversity of crops, adding cover crops, adding livestock, level of disturbance, maintaining living roots to feed soil biology. Well, yes. Just, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Answer, yes. <laughs> yes these, these are all important. You've just got to be, um, you've got to be realistic. What you can do in a, in, one, in one single experiment, is you just can't do everything. Um, I mean, you know, I think in in the lot, sort of long term experiments we've been talking about, the treatments are fairly fixed. Okay, you may change it from time to time, but they're pretty um, rigorous. Now, what you, there is a different type of experiment, and I'm not involved in them, but some of my colleagues at Rothamsted have just been starting uh, a couple of sites where they've got, they intend to be long term, but they're a bit more flexible. So they are more like system experiments. Um, uh, Perhaps to some extent a bit like the the century experiment at, at Davis, but maybe even more flexible than that. So there's a 
I can't remember the right words, but it could be a sort of a, um, a, a very conventional, uh, perhaps a more lower input organic sort of system and a mixed one. But the actual treatments, the idea is they can change over time to reflect a new no agronomic knowledge and so on. So I think that approach as a, um, an adjunct to our traditional long term experiments um, you know, it's pretty valuable. And in that you can do things like, you know, I, I think things like having um, multiple crops in the same place and agroforestry are all going to be useful things for the future. And I think these can be studied in these more flexible, but still hopefully long running experiments. Yeah, great, great answer. I'll, I'll just add that, you know, farmers really do appreciate research that's done more at a systems level because that relates more closely to the their realities in terms of how they're they're trying to to make decisions and and approve their their cropping systems and so I, I think there's a, a certain amount of that in your research portfolio that you need again and then other kinds of questions though lend themselves to small plots or more directed kinds of of, um, of uh, treatments that really are intended to answer very very specific questions so so you know having systems level research combined with you know or more other scale or other more directed kinds of research is important to have. And I'll just emphasize too that, um, you know, I think part of the challenge now that we have and, and really some of the weakness of our current uh, farming systems is the lack of diversity. So the lack of options <laughs> and, you know, increasing our adaptive capacity, actually having viable options when various kinds of stressors that seem to be and uncertainties that seem to be increasing in the world, whether it's climate change or market fluctuations or government policy, all of these are contributing to a more uncertain world and really having you know, options and as researchers providing various options that can help to address various issues as they arise and to know how they're, they're going to be able to, to be used effectively, I think could really help to, to bolster the, you know, the overall resiliency and adaptive capacity of our current farming systems. I'll just add that um, it does seem like a lot of the um, results from farmers are sort of this like regenerative ag field that has some other names too, but, um, and Dave sort of alluded to this very diplomatically, but it does seem like, you know, there's many practices that are combined and you get this incredible you know, striking results, like incredible organic matter increases. And um, I'm not sure if that's really been like, there's not that many experiments that explore that. Like, what if you layer all this and do you really get more than the sum of the parts? Um, so it could be, you know, an avenue for just like putting a number on that and like sort of standardizing it in an experimental way. Um, uh, suggests or like, you know, what this suggests is that it could be powerful. Yeah, I think this is just a benefit of doing on-farm research because then you get to mix the research thinking in with the farmer thinking and you're going to come up with a different interpretation of, and also expectations in terms of what can actually be accomplished and what is kind of out of the realm of any kind of reality, you know, in terms of an expected outcome. So I think that's, you know, that I think we, you know, in terms of research, it's very easy to separate yourself. And this becomes, I think, a little bit dangerous in agriculture. You know, we need to be really engaged with our farmers and engage to the extent that you really understand how they're looking at things and what kinds of issues they have and, and what their thinking is like. And, and I think this becomes very important and crucial when we're looking at any kind of you know, sustainable kinds of, of agricultural research to be able to really ask the right questions and also to be relevant in terms of how you're going to move forward into the future. So I'll just emphasize that point. And, you know, we also see a lot of on-farm research being done that is kind of a little bit divorced from the research community and, and you know, outcomes that we're saying, oh my gosh, this cannot even, you know, there's, you know, this doesn't have the kind, but this is something that a lot of growers are really attuned to and looking at, and they're very much attuned to these kinds of outcomes that are occurring that I think could really, you know, benefit from having our integration as researchers into the process and into the thinking and into the interpretation that goes on here.
that's going to take us to have more engagement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even within our, you know, even I said, our very focused long-term experiment, you know, I said we need multidisciplinary thinking. We, our committee, uh, which which does this, includes our farm manager. So the manager mm -hmm. of our experimental farm is a farmer, and he has to, to run the farm. So even within that, you know, a very little, I mean, I fully agree with the points about, you know, on-farm work and research and so on, but even within our sort of narrow bounds, we try to get that to some extent through um, the knowledge of our farm manager, as well as all of the uh, the academics well thank you all for your time i want to be mindful of everyone's time um and we've had a lot of really great questions in the the chat and we can't get to all of them but i see others have been been answering them um as well so um, i want to thank our panelists very much for your presentations and for your thoughts on these questions and for staying uh, over the, the session time. And thank you for all of our attendees, many of whom have stuck around for this conversation. Um, so we will continue SoilCon this afternoon um, with more, more discussion of soil health assessments and indicators. And thank you again to all of the panelists. Yep, thank, thank you all, it was great. Great listening.